Hello, thanks for joining another Insight Tech Talk. This is a special CXO edition. I'm Jillian Viner, and I'm joined today by Danny Allen, the Chief Technology Officer and SVP of Product Strategy for Veeam. Danny, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Jillian. Delighted to be here and excited to have the conversation. Awesome. So. Veeam's a pretty well-known name. You guys have experienced explosive growth recently, but just for the benefit of our audience, go ahead and tell us who is Veeam? What do you do? So the, the easy way I describe it from you know my friends, my parents would be we do backup and we've been doing backup really, really well for the last 15 years. We just had our 15th uh, birthday party. Uh, we started out doing backup for the virtual space and then over the last 15 years, we've expanded that. So we do virtual, of course, but we also do physical systems. We do cloud systems. We do Kubernetes. We do lots of different types of backup. But at the end of the day, what we do is help uh, companies, organizations protect their data. I imagine you have a lot of grateful customers. We do, especially in an <laughs> era where they're being faced with malware and ransomware and you know hardware outages and disasters. Um, a lot of really great stories and it, you know, it gets you up in the morning. It makes you excited to, to help customers in this way. Yeah, that's great. And it's going to be a passion about that kind of work. And you've had a really interesting kind of career path sort of a fast tracked career path. I'm curious, we're, we're really into this theme of ambition at Insight right now. It's really taken over our company. It's where we're headed for 2022. What's the most ambitious thing that you've done either in your career or your personal life? Well, everything that I do, I'm an idealist at heart, so I want to change the world. I've always wanted to change the world. So um, at every company I go to, I have this big, hairy, audacious goal personally to, to change markets. And so if you look, for example, my first company was a security company, and it was, we are going to secure every application that exists in the whole world. That's what we're going to do. And... I was very, you know, delighted by working at that company. It was very exciting. We we had an excellent uh, run. We were acquired by IBM. It was a very successful um, endeavor for me. And then I moved on. It was okay. We've secured the applications. Now I'm going to secure all of the desktops. Because one of the interesting things after IBM acquired us um, was that I learned people, uh, individuals, often do things that you know they could have done a better job at securing things. And I thought, well. If you took every desktop and you put it in the cloud, then you could then you could enable the controls that even if they did something by mistake, that they were protected. And so we started a whole new category of desktops as a service and secure desktops from the cloud. And again, it, it was an ambitious, audacious goal, but it was very exciting. We changed the market um, and ultimately excellent, you know, successful thing. We we were acquired by VMware. That was very exciting. And in some ways, I'm doing the same thing that I did at the start of my career, securing data, securing desktops. Now I'm securing data uh, for organizations. So these organizations, they depend on the data that they have to enable their operations and be successful. And uh, that is what Veeam does. So, you know, every organization that I've joined, I've looked at it and thought, how can we change the world? And that's what I'm still doing today. Love it. We, our CEO and, and, and excuse me, our president, incoming CEO, has that same sort of philosophy of being ambitious about changing the world and, and has this really strong belief that technology, tech for good, really can make those ambitious goals happen. So it's one, one project, one company at a time, right? Yes. I don't take these things lightly. Even my you asked outside of my career. I read a book once back in 2009 about a shipwreck that was lost and um, the Navy had looked for it for several years. The author of the of the book had written, looked for it for several years. And actually, probably the, the most audacious goal I've ever taken was I'm going to go find that shipwreck. The Navy couldn't find it. This author couldn't find it. I'm going to go out on the ocean and find <laughs> that shipwreck. And actually, we did. It took us, took us you about did. five Yes. Uh, myself and and three friends. I'm a scuba diver, a technical scuba diver. We find shipwrecks in my free time. Um, anyway, we 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 ended up. It was data that helped us find the wreck. We had side scan sonar data. We had proton magnetometer data. We did a lot of analysis. But ultimately, and it is a technology story. We probably don't have time to get into it. But it took five years. Um, we found that shipwreck and it changed lives. The, the sailors on that ship, it was the last U.S. Navy warship sunk in the Atlantic Ocean during World War II. 
two weeks before the end of the war, it was April 23rd, and um, there was 13 survivors. Four of them said they saw a German U-boat, and um, and the Navy said, no way, there's no U-boats operating off the, the coast of the U.S. Uh, a few weeks before the end of the war. And so, you know, talk about ambitious. We were going to go find that wreck, and we were going to answer the question of, was it torpedoed by a German U-boat, or did the boilers explode, which is what the Navy uh, claimed. And ultimately, we did. We found the ship. We determined that uh, it was not the boilers, and it changed lives, the lives of the families, both of the victims and of the survivors. So very, very proud of that. But it, it I'm ambitious. <laughs> I That's read amazing. And I thought, I'm going to go find the ship. So... <laughs> That is ambitious and incredible. I mean, nice little side hobby that turns into this kind of life-changing five-year adventure. That's incredible. Yeah, they, they actually did a Smithsonian documentary on it. So I'm very proud of that, but I'm, I'm very proud in everything that I do. I think, how can we change the world? How can we do things better than they've been done historically? So scuba diver, shipwreck finder, <laughs> You also have, as I mentioned at the top, is this title of CTO, and you became the Veeam CTO in December of 2019. What was the scope of your role when you started, and how has that changed? Because I imagine it probably changed dramatically after 2019. It did. So in 2019, when I became CTO, really I was focused on three things, which was thought leadership for the company. Um, secondly, very much driving the product direction of the of Veeam software. And then lastly, engaging in the communities. And almost immediately, about three months after I became CTO, we were acquired by Insight Partners. And that was fantastic. But it definitely changed the role because now I'm working within a portfolio of companies that Insight owns. Um, and so it just... it changed dramatically how we were operating. I was given access to so much more information, so many more collaborative collaborative partners um, while here at Veeam Software. And then, of course, if you go forward another year and being hit by the pandemic, all of a sudden we were very used to doing things physically in person. And all of a sudden we were doing everything virtually and, and remote. And so again, it, it's been another shift in what we've done, but Ultimately, it's it's we've been very successful here at Veeam Software, and I've been very proud of the team. And it really is a team effort, uh, so it's gone well. Looking back on it, in hindsight, was there something like that you feel really good about the decision that you made, and then counterably, was there something that you wish you'd done differently? Well, when we first uh, when the pandemic hit, what we didn't do, a decision we made is we wouldn't just pick up the events that we've been doing in person and move them into the virtual format. We would tailor it for the virtual format. So an example of this is we would give keynotes on stage, and that was very much a one direction communication of what we were doing. When we switched to virtual, we said, okay, let's moderate all of the sessions and let's interact live with the audience. And so I was very thankful that worked out very well. We've pivoted uh, very successfully. The things that I look back and, and re regret's probably too strong a word. I, I wish I had realized earlier on how much impact it had at a human level. I mean, the mm. pandemic has impacted everyone individually in very different ways. And I don't think I realized at the beginning how much mental wellness and ensuring that not just teams, but individuals were doing well. Um, I wish I'd focused a bit more on that early on, but of course now we're, we're very focused on that. In fact, we just gave everyone at the company of, at Veeam uh, a day off earlier this week for, for mental wellness. But uh, certainly interesting times, but fantastic when you have a team like the team here at Veeam Software uh, during you know, these, these types of circumstances. Yeah, that's terrific. It's it's funny. It doesn't seem like something that companies would normally have to think about, right, is the, the mental wellness of employees. There always kind of was that separation, and obviously the lines have been blurred a lot. Not only have the lines been blurred, but particularly in, in the IT area, the, the responsibilities and the expectations and demands of IT have just, you know, blown out of the water, right? Um, Insight just did our annual report. It's our intelligent technology report. We do this report every year. This year we did it in partnership with IDG. 
we surveyed about 400 IT decision makers to kind of find out, you know, how did the year go? Where's their technology investments going? Where are they struggling? Um, and the findings were, they're always illuminating, but this year in particular was very telling about kind of the, the impact of everything. And what I want to call out just a couple of those findings to you. 40% said that security and or data privacy deficiencies is one of the top inhibitors for IT modernization. Now, 45% also ranked upgrading security technology and processing as a top priority for 2022 to support their business goals. That's a lot. So you're probably in a great position for this over at Veeam. So how are you guys working to help customers with those securities, data, and modernization challenges for even yourselves and for your clients? Yeah, and it is for both. That's an important point, Jillian, because... We had an unfair advantage, first of all, I'll start off by saying, because internally, one of the things that we've been doing even before the pandemic was to secure our systems. We went through the process, even though we're not offering direct services ourselves, getting an ISO 27001 certification, for example. And we were in the process of launching something known as Veeam Government Services, which required a lot of security certifications. And on a software level, if you look at what we're building, we were doing things like making sure the you know, the components that we use were FIPS 140-2 compliant and going through all of these um, security certifications and, and process validation internally at Veeam. So we were in a very good position. But one of the things I'm most proud of is what we've done for our customer base of 400,000 customers, because at the same time as COVID-19 hit and the world changed, all of a sudden ransomware and malware, but specifically ransomware started attacking uh, the market. And what does Veeam do? We, we protect data. In fact, you could argue that um, backup is your last and best line of defense if you can do secure backups. And so our software is being used around the globe, like I said, 400,000 customers. And we really are focused on making sure that our customers have their data protected. And one of the things that we did even most recently, because sometimes <clears throat> customers don't always do things or, or you know, configure things correctly. One of the things that we're doing now is we're putting the reporting right in our product that says, hey, you should be making this data immutable. So if you do get ransomware, they can't come in and delete your backups or encrypt your, your, uh, your backups themselves. And so we actually are putting the reporting and analysis within our product that help our customers have better outcomes and be more intelligent about their own business. And so we're just in a very good spot. I, I do expect that the threat that we face will continue to increase, but Veeam is in a very strong position to help uh, the industry. I would agree. It's it's definitely been... Um... I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody could say that the spike in cyberware was maybe unexpected, but perhaps the velocity of it or just the expansion of it and the sophistication. Yeah, the sophistication is people overlook how much it has evolved in the last decade. I remember I, I spent a decade in the security industry. That was my first company. And I remember looking at the code of the Stuxnet. I don't know if you remember that. It was this, it was a malware that would accelerate, um, well, it doesn't matter. It, it, it did <laughs> Siemens Step 7 controllers and it would cause meltdowns and nuclear reactors. And I remember looking at the code to get access to the code base of that and thinking, wow, very sophisticated code. But I look now at the underlying infrastructure, if you want to call it that, or the code behind the ransomware that we're seeing. And it is mm -hmm. very, very well written, extremely sophisticated. It doesn't just get in and try and you know, encrypt your data, it gets in and it tries to understand your environment and the context and all of your systems. And it, I, I was speaking with a customer just recently where the ransomware came in and it sat dormant for a period of time. And then it would slowly increase its activity because of course it didn't want to be detected. And as soon as they detected it, they had the intelligence built into the platform to know that they'd been found out. And then all of a sudden it went crazy. It tried to do as much damage in as short a time as possible. That level of sophistication tells you that the enemy that we face is stepping up their game and we need to do the same on the defense side. Well said, and there's a lot to unpack there and that's even just the behind the scenes. But I think you made a comment earlier about, you know, 
the, the, the vulnerability in just in how we use our devices, right? We've had conversations with other partners about developing security just to protect people that are just going about their business that accidentally click an email that looks, you know, like it's a proper email. It's, it's very easy to fall victim and fall trap. And we just, it's hard to be on guard, right? And you don't want security to be in the way of people doing their jobs or going about their days, but um, it's just a lot harder to be on defense these days. Yeah, when people ask me where they should put their investments, I always say the first line of defense, which is user education and awareness and training. And we do that here ourselves at Veeam. Everyone goes through certification and regular updating and training, but then also the last line of defense to protect your data, because it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, and when ultimately they do find a, a vulnerability in, in your uh, protective solutions, you want to be able to recover as quickly as possible. And again, that's very much what we're focused on at Veeam Software. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to throw you a curveball here, but do you have an example that you could share with us of a client that either wasn't set up and had a difficult time or maybe was set up and how easy it was for them to kind of get back up and running? Um, as you might imagine, the ones that are most impactful and significant they don't want to talk about um, i won't name the healthcare facility but there was there was a circumstance where a customer they had a child who was flying inbound on a helicopter and at the same time for some life-saving surgery and at the same time that that child was flying inbound on a helicopter their systems had gone offline because of malware and so they were frantically trying to get the systems up and running again so when this child landed they could do operation uh, an operation or whatever medical procedure it was on them and so that's the type of activity that really makes you stop and think about the human impact of these types of things the 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 stories that we can tell that are you know put a name behind them are, are often much less impactful than that but then but no less impactful to the organization themselves sure. there's a steel company in in michigan that was part of our recent conference and and uh they were they were speaking about uh an event where someone had misconfigured something and malware got in and it started deleting their entire database of all of their employees over a weekend and they had Veeam software and thankfully on Monday they were able to get it back. But, you know, those are the types of stories you wake up and you feel very good that you are part of the solution to, to what is a very significant problem in the industry. If CTOs are having a hard time sleeping at night, you guys are there to help them <laughs> go to bed a little bit easier. Exactly. <laughs> I'm glad you actually brought up a healthcare example. Obviously, that's an industry that was immensely impacted by everything and, and will continue to be. We're seeing them pivot over to more of a uh, you know remote patient care through FaceTime, et cetera. That's just one example of an impressive, innovative shift that we've seen from industries. I'm curious, you know, we've seen a lot of ambition from companies, even our own clients have done amazing things in response to be more innovative, more digital. Is there something that you've seen that's really caught your eye that you just think is, gosh, that company is really being ambitious and it's, it's paying off? Well, if you look at an industry level, I do think the healthcare industry is a fantastic example of difficulties driving success because I think telehealth is an amazing thing. Wouldn't it be incredible if you could get up every morning and, and with someone in front of you do an analysis to say, you know, am I at risk of transmission? And the person can help you right on the spot to determine whether you should be going out or not going out. Or education is another one. One of the things the pandemic has done is changed the education industry to enable much more remote education. So I love these stories of optimism that emerge in difficult times, but um, you asked for a specific example. I guess maybe I'd say Lidos. Lidos is a Fortune 500 information technology company. They play in the defense, the intelligence, um, the civil healthcare space as well, very large provider. And they had, they were delivering services kind of the traditional way where it took you know, months to, to create a service. And just recently in the last few years, they picked up 130 of their services. They moved it into the cloud. In their case, it was AWS GovCloud. And they completely reworked how they develop applications using something known as portable DevSecOps. Essentially, it's a way using continuous integration, continuous development, where they could deliver services 
in hours, not days, not weeks, not months, but literally could deploy services within hours and still be fully compliant and secure and doing all of the things that they needed to. And I was very impressed with their story. They, they essentially completely reworked, transformed their business. And Veeam was a part of that. Casting K10 was what did the data protection and data recovery for their new solution framework. And those are the kinds of stories that, again, are very exciting because it, it's companies that are disrupting themselves and delivering solutions more quickly and, and more securely than, uh, mm -hmm. than they ever had in the past. That's great. I, DevOps is, is a big piece of something that our own teammates and experts have been talking about and trying to get companies to embrace and understand a little bit more. I love that you called out that it's taking those challenges and, and really flipping them on their head and turning them into those opportunities. That's such a critical mindset for companies right now. Is there, you know, not to take us down a negative path, but you know, maybe there are organizations that aren't seeing that opportunity. Do you think that there's places where organizations are not being necessarily ambitious enough? Either in maybe, what they're doing as a business or their IT? Yeah, maybe data privacy, um, I would okay. highlight as an area. I really believe that the big challenges that face society today. So you think health care, climate change, sustainability, whatever it happens to be, clean drinking water, education. A lot of these things can be solved if as an industry, we were more willing to share our data with one another. But of mm. course, the challenge with sharing our data with one another is that we're sharing our data with one another. <laughs> Users have a right to privacy to their own data. And 40 years ago, there was, right after the RSA encryption technology came out, there was a thesis put out, a theory put out around something known as homomorphic encryption. The idea was that you could manipulate data without decrypting the data. As soon as you encrypted it, you would have the ability to still use it, think of it within a database, but without decrypting it so you couldn't see. And I think we're missing an opportunity as an industry to find ways to share data, but to do it in a secure way that is fully compliant. For homomorphic encryption, by the way, we, we've come a long way in the last 40 years. And in fact, just last year was kind of the first, I'll say practical use of sharing data without decrypting data. But I think we could be more ambitious as an industry. And I, I think we need to. I think we need to share data to solve some of these big problems. You can imagine for a moment, we're so concerned about healthcare and the spreading of, of coronavirus. You can imagine if if the transportation companies, the airlines, and, and could securely share data with the healthcare companies that are sharing data with the, you know, the people that are doing um, not just hospital hospitalized healthcare, but the sequencing of of you know the as the coronavirus as it changes. If you could share those data sets, you could unlock a lot more intelligence of the context of the problems in which we find ourselves. But I, I just think we're not ambitious enough. I think these are things that can be done and we, we should be doing more. We could be doing more. Yeah, just a lot of trepidation around data sharing. I mean, you you nailed it. You, you summarized that, it well, it's there's a benefit, but it, man, it's kind of scary and we're all very protective of it. Yes. You know, we talked about some of the digital acceleration that's happened from COVID-19. A lot of companies we know have had to quickly modernize their IT, maybe are still trying to modernize their IT to support more of a hybrid workforce. Obviously, shifting to the cloud was a huge, huge ambition for 2020. What do you see as the next big digital trend in transformation? I really think it's containers. Um, containers and Kubernetes specifically for orchestration of containers. Everyone said that the big shift in the industry was, you know, from physical to virtual to cloud. I actually think the better way of looking at it is the big shift is from physical to virtual to containers because the cloud was really virtualization on someone else's hardware. It was a go to market model. And, and I'm not discounting that in any way. It's, it's a massive benefit to having a go to market model where you can pay in a consumption basis. But I think containers do something that is unique 
and extremely valuable for the organization. One is it makes our workloads completely portable. It's, it's the promise that was made with Java or <laughs> whatever, pick your technology 20 years ago. It means you can build a workload and you can run it on premises using Red Hat OpenShift. You can go to you know, Amazon with AKS or EC, uh, sorry, EKS or, or ECS or to Azure with their AKS or Google with GKE. But you can make the workload completely portable and there's a lot of benefits and reasons why you would want to do that. Not the least of which is you can take advantage of elasticity. I would argue the cloud is not a charity. They're, they're going to layer in margin, whatever that margin is going to be. And you might want to run to your low water mark within your own data center because you have the control, you have the capacity. Why would you not leverage it? But you might not want to build to your high water mark if you're talking to a, you know, a university or a, a college and all of the students are logging in and using their systems on Thursday night. You probably don't want to to build to that high water mark. You probably want to build to your low water mark, but then leverage the portability, but the elasticity of cloud and consumption models for those bursts of demand. So I, I think the next generation. The, the next big wave is going to be containers and uh, and Kubernetes. I don't think we're quite there yet, to be honest. It's still complex. We still have to cross the chasm, but I believe we will. There's enough very smart people that are looking at this that I have no doubt that we will cross that chasm. It's an ambitious goal for the future. Yes. <laughs> Well, speaking of crossing the chasm, it sounds like we need more skills in that area, more learning, more discovering. Again, the role of IT has really expanded. The list of priorities has grown exponentially. At the same time, there is a talent shortage. IT supply chains are lagging. You know, what does someone like you do? What advice do you have for other IT decision makers that are facing such ambitious plans amidst so many challenges? It's probably not um, groundbreaking what I'm going to say, but it would be prioritization. <laughs> prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. There are more things to distract us than ever before. Inflation, pandemics, cloud, Kubernetes, security, malware, uh, talent shortage, talent drain right now, the great resignation, people realizing, you know what? Family matters. I don't know if I really want to work. We should be figuring out how to not lose that talent, but still give them what they need to be mentally well. So I'm not going to say what I believe is the priority, because frankly, I, do, I think it's different for every organization. Um, but as a leader, as an IT leader, one of the things I challenge myself with every day is what are the top three things that I care about? And I'll focus on those. And you don't ignore the other things. You delegate them. You delegate them to, to other people within the organization. But for the things that you really care about, you need to keep an eye on and keep your finger on the pulse of them continuously. So it's the prioritization. And that's not different than it's been for the last 30 years. But that's probably a good thing. We know what we need to do. And I would assume that prioritization list probably has a mix of those business priorities and those personal priorities to keep that mental health and, you know, the need to be with family and take a break. It sounds like that's probably part of your, your rationale. It is. I get outside every single day and enjoy the outside. I need it for my mental health. I love <laughs> technology, by the way, of course I do. And finding shipwrecks and being out on the water. Actually, one of the things, um, that I like most about scuba diving is I can't get email, I can't get text. No one can get a hold of me when I'm 200 <laughs> feet underwater. <It's> brilliant. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so every day I'm out, you know, hiking in the woods behind my home or on the weekends out in the water to take a break, to, to give my mind, you know, a, a disconnection from the stresses that are, for, you know, pushing against it every single day. Mm-hmm. I love that. I, I too. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. The weather is beautiful right now and the hiking trails are just calling my name. So Danny, I'm curious before we close out today, I know that we just talked about setting your priorities. So I'd like to know how are you or how is Veeam going to be ambitious in 2022? So one of the things that we're very focused on is data protecting, data protection and protecting the data within the cloud. We have 
done very well or we're very well of aware of the fact that if I have a data center, I need to protect the data within it. And I would argue that you know, maybe 80 to 90% of the data within the data center, we have a good plan for data protection. Um, or we should have a good plan for data protection. <laughs> that is not true in the cloud. And I'm, I'm grouping a whole lot of things in cloud, certainly the hyperscale public cloud, but also SaaS cloud services. If you look at Office 365 or Salesforce or Workday or ServiceNow or, or these different infrastructures, right now, less than 10% of cloud hosted workflows are being protected. And I look at that and think, we need to protect the data. So, so my ambitious goal, it's not necessarily for Veeam to win that business, although clearly I would like that, we would like that if we <laughs> want to, but I just want the awareness within the industry. And if we can get to 25% of the data in cloud being protected by the end of 2025, uh, 2025, that would be a win. For next year, I would say, even if we can get to 15%, that would be a win, 15% of the data, which is not very much. Um, but that's my goal. Make the industry drive the awareness of the need to protect the data, not just in your data center, but when it's out in the public cloud as well. It's great words of advice, good wisdom, and sounds like a really smart goal. Danny, thank you so much for joining us in the virtual studio today. It was great to hear your insights and a little bit about what you're discovering underwater and what Veeam is up to. Well, thank you, Jillian. I always enjoy meeting others and, and sharing the stories of what we're doing at, at Veeam with uh, other organizations. And for our listeners, you can catch more of Danny in the winter issue of the Tech Journal. It's going to be our Be Ambitious issue. We're featuring a lot more client stories to hear you know, how clients have managed to be ambitious among so much disruption. It's a great place to get inspiration, find some guidance, and again, more insights to help you in your own IT strategy. So you can find that issue at insight.com slash tech journal. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time.